Let us therefore do as I suggest. We can move from place to place, spending one day here and another there, pursuing whatever pleasures and entertainment the present times will afford. In this way of life we shall continue until such time as we discover, provided we are spared from early death, the end decreed by heaven for these terrible events. Hello and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And we have just read Giovanni Boccaccio's The Decameron. I have a feeling we're not alone. Yes. No, I've seen many people buying this. When we set up a link to this book uh, with the last episode, Amazon was sold out. Oh, wow. Not that you need to buy from Amazon, but we do have affiliate links there, and it makes it easier for a lot of people. So Patronize your local bookstores when you can. Exactly. But yeah, uh, this is a very topical book these days. Uh, we're recording this at the end of March 2020, and The Decameron is a story of people in the time of the plague. Yeah, dealing with a crisis that is dangerous in itself, but also dangerous in what it does to society. Um, family structures, communal structures, towns, cities, and so on. And I think people are feeling that stress and that pressure in all kinds of ways right now. How are you holding up? Uh, well, we're fortunate, I think, in that you know we moved last August, and so we're in a larger place than we had lived in before. We always lived in a city, and now we're living uh, in the countryside, right? Sort of more more remote suburbia. So it's easy to go outside for walks and be in the sunshine and so on. And and I'm really grateful for that. And having more space, it means a lot to us right now because I have a couple of my kids at home. And so the house is pretty full. Like it's not full in a bad way, but you know, uh, it's easy to step on one another's toes. So I feel very grateful for those circumstances. But I think even being fortunate in all those ways, everybody is feeling pressure um, in, in their own individual ways. How about you? What is your household like? So I am mostly a stay and work at home kind of person anyways. Not always that unusual for me to not go outside for days at a stretch. Um, my husband is a bit more anxious sometimes, and he hasn't been dealing with things that well, but he has been finding some new ways of keeping spirits up and keeping community up, even as we are keeping separate from the rest of the world, which is not entirely unlike what the characters in the Decameron decide to do. So I have read this book in bits and pieces before. As most people probably know, this is a collection of a hundred short stories with a frame tale around it. And it's perfect for dipping into reading a story here, reading a story there, learning from somebody that one story is really juicy and skipping ahead to it, reading it on its own. You can enjoy the stories on their own without the frame tale, but you can also enjoy reading the entire book end to end, cover to cover if you'd like. Yeah, I feel like people reading the Decameron right now might read it in two very different modes. One where you dipped into the stories and the way you just described looking for distraction, things that stories that don't demand too much of you, a book you can dip into and out of, and that's great. But others might be interested in the ways in which the frame kind of sets up what you do in a time of crisis. What what are some of the ways you can manage it? And manage it not just individually, but also collectively. And that's very much what the introduction is preoccupied with. It opens with a description of the effects of plague on people, by which I mean not just the physical effects, though he does talk about that, but also the social effects. He describes how the kinds of relationships that you might ordinarily see between people break down. He says, large numbers of men and women abandoned their city, their homes, their relatives, their estates, and their belongings, and headed for the countryside, either in Florentine territory or better still, abroad. Uh, neglecting their neighbors and rarely or never visiting their relatives, addressing them only from a distance. This scourge had implanted so great a terror in the hearts of men and women that brothers abandoned brothers, uncles their nephews, sisters their brothers, and in many cases, wives deserted their husbands. But even worse and almost incredible was the fact that fathers and mothers refused to nurse and assist their own children as though they did not belong to them. I mean, and there's a lot more of this, uh, this description of like how plague destroys the health of the body, but it also destroys the body politic, like it destroys the fabric of society. And we sort of begin with this panoramic view of plague, how it affects people. And then we get to a little cluster of people, um, these women who are in the church of Santa Maria Novella, uh, which is a kind of a really cute pun by Boccaccio. It's a 
Santa Maria Novella, it's sort of the new Church of St. Mary, but it's also a little joke because novella also means a short story. So it's a really neat place to have the, the camera and storytelling undertaking begin. And so these women are together, and one of the group of seven women um, is talking about how, how bad things have gotten in the city. And she says, we're lingering here for no purpose, she says. If we return to our home, she says, what happens? I don't know whether your own experience is similar to mine, but my house was once full of servants, and now that there is no one left apart from my maid and myself, I am filled with foreboding and feel as if every hair on my head is standing on end. Wherever I go in the house, wherever I pause to rest, I seem to be haunted by the shades of the departed, whose faces no longer appear as I remember them, but with strange and horribly twisted expressions that frighten me out of my senses. And so she proposes leaving town and spending time together, both to protect their physical health and also, you know, when she talks about being alone in a home that was once filled with people, to make new community, to make purposeful households, to choose to be together in a positive way, in a forward-looking way, as opposed to simply enduring alone. And so in order to keep a semblance of propriety and to keep order, they decide they need some men. So they look around the church and they see three young men who are related one way or the other to some of the women of the group and who also happen to be in love with some three of the women in the group. So perfect, right? So they make a proposal to have the men join with them and they head out to the first house where they'll begin their storytelling game. And so one of the women, Pompanea, says, a merry life should be our aim, since it was for no other reason that we were prompted to run away from the sorrows of the city. However, nothing will last very long unless it possesses a definite form. And so she suggests that each day they're going to elect someone to be the king or queen of the day, and they will each take turns, and the ruler of the day will, you know, entertain the rest of the people, provide food, arrange all things like that. And that also, each evening, they're going to tell stories. They're going to take turns, each of them, telling stories to the rest of the group. And eventually, it'll be decided that whoever the king or queen is will get to choose what the topic of the next evening's stories will be. Yeah, and that's part of the ways in which the community grows and develops over time, because they don't start out initially with the daily theme requirement. Uh, that's something that develops you know, once they get into the new storytelling setting. And also a little bit later on, they'll make another accommodation. The ruler of uh, one of the particular days will say to Dioneo, who's this kind of most trickster figure, he's a, he'll, he'll say inappropriate things to make people laugh, right? He gets the last story and the last word. Well, he yeah, he gets the privilege of always telling the last story. And it's really interesting to think about what the effect of that is, what the purpose of that is. The choice is not made to say, oh, do you know you tell bad stories? You can't tell a story. It's to say, oh, okay, we're going to kind of bracket. We're going to contain that chaos within the orderly structure of our game. It will always be the punctuating story, you know, that we kind of laugh with and end with. Dioneo's order in the storytelling, along with a lot of the other things they do, are ways of managing a chaotic environment, right? This horrible environment of the plague-ravaged city that they're fleeing, but also managing the propensity for chaos that's already in every gathering of people, right? Giving a structure that enables them to achieve a kind of an equilibrium, a kind of stability, and to be restored to a state of mind where ultimately by the end of the book, they'll be ready to go back home to Florence after those 14 days of storytelling out in the countryside. Yeah, it's interesting because, as you said, the first day, there was no theme. They haven't thought of having a theme. And then whoever is in charge decides that for the second day, that, yeah, we're going to have a theme this time just to give us a bit more structure. So that's fun. Somewhere around the eighth or ninth day. It's the eighth book where they give them a break. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we've had a bit too much of a theme, and storytellers are like work animals, and sometimes you need to let them roam free a bit. So we're going to have a day where we don't have a theme just to relax ourselves. So there's this constant back and forth, this ebbing and flowing of the amount of structure you need in order to stay sane. Well, it's really interesting. I was actually thinking about that earlier today, getting ready for our conversation. Like, it's in a way, it's an ebbing and flowing, a back and forth. Yeah, we had no structure, now we're having no structure again. But it's different. They've gotten somewhere different so that they can tell stories that are not following a particular theme, but they're still in keeping with the larger undertakings of the storytelling game. You know what I mean? Like the, the storytellers are in a bit different place. So they're able to use that freedom. Like earlier, it was a lack of structure. Now it's a use of freedom within a structure. Right. And then the last day, 
they're going to move into themes that, how can I put it, really say something about how the individual enhances the society that they inhabit. Um, so in day 10, the theme is munificence, right? Generosity, like free giving. And so it's a really kind of exalted theme that is meant to lift you up and let you think about what you can do for others and not just what you can do for yourself, as you know, as opposed to that sort of panicked serving of your own needs that is evoked in the introduction talking about the plague. And then beyond the introduction, there are 10 speakers and there are 10 days of storytelling. There are two weekends. They take Friday and Saturdays off. So over the course of two weeks, over the course of 14 days, you've got 10 days of storytelling times 10 storytellers leads to a very nice 100 stories in this massive collection. So that's the overall structure of the book. But I'm curious, how was this originally put out into the world? Because there's this really interesting moment at the beginning of day four, where the author steps in and sort of talks to some of his critics about some perceived complaints about how the book might be a little too inappropriate, a little too sexy for ladies to be reading. Yeah. Well, he talks a lot about this imagined audience of ladies, right? Um, At that point in book four, absolutely. At the end also, and in the introduction, where he sort of says he's written this book to amuse women because women suffer a lot in love and they don't have access to the kind of distractions that men do. So they can, men can go out hunting or hawking or whatever, but, you know, women, they're cooped up. And if they're, you know, lovesick, what are they going to do? They need some good stories. So he's kind of positioning himself as addressing this audience and as you say, elsewhere also responding to these imagined critics. The general critical sense is that, not that there aren't maybe real critics out there, but but he's kind of constructing that. Like it's a rhetorical stance where he's responding to, you know, some might say this, 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 but, right. And the records we have of early manuscripts are really interesting because we didn't talk much about Boccaccio's biography, but the one thing that's interesting to notice is he writes works in Italian and he also writes works in Latin. And it was often kind of uh, soon to be the case that he writes these early works in Italian. And then once humanism starts taking off, he's writing in this sort of classical style Latin in the same way that his contemporary Petrarch was committed to writing in Latin. But interestingly, Boccaccio was working on and revising his Decameron well into his old age because we have the autograph manuscript and we can see what he was doing with the text. And and just to be clear, the autograph manuscript is the term that we use to describe the manuscript written in the author's own handwriting. Yeah, exactly. And so we can see that he was re- actually revising it and working with it and still valued it. And that's interesting in two ways, I think. One is that it tells us that that old story about moving from the vernacular into Latin and leaving the vernacular behind, that's not what went on at all. The reality is a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting. But the other thing it tells us is that the Decameron was a work that on the one hand, is a proximate response to the plague. It's written presumably in the 1350s in response to the experience of plague in Europe, 1348 to 51, right? But it's also a work that was in progress into the 1370s. Uh, Boccaccio dies in 1375. So it's inhabiting this curious kind of position where it's both responding to the immediate trauma of the plague, but also reflecting on that time from the vantage point of a couple of decades later. Do we have manuscripts of the text from then that show the manuscript in different states of being edited? Uh, Not that I know of, though I could be wrong about that. And if we find anything, we can add it in the show notes. I think that the text that people tend to look at authoritatively is the autograph manuscript, which dates from the 1370s. So it's like within two decades after the work is written, that's pretty early in the world of manuscripts, right? So we don't know a lot about other circulation. It is true, though, that Individual stories from the Decameron or little clusters of stories from the Decameron do circulate in manuscript compilations. And other writers, Chaucer is one of them, adapt stories of Boccaccio's in different kinds of ways. Um, and some some critics have pointed out resemblances of certain stories in the Decameron to individual Canterbury tales, for example. Though the jury is kind of out on whether Chaucer knew a written text of the Decameron or not. Well, that's true. Although stories don't necessarily spread only in manuscripts, right? You can remember this story that you heard from somebody telling a story that they found out from the Decameron, and that can easily travel with people, right? Yeah, that's a really important point, I think, that the stories on the one hand, you know, how can I put it, they inhabit this kind of literary landscape, and we could be thinking about manuscript sources and how these are passed on over time, whether they're sources that Boccaccio knew and reworked into new stories, or adaptations of Boccaccio's stories that 
engender new written works. But there's also this oral quality, which is very much in play. And some of the stories in the Decameron really, really, really make this clear. The extent to which, you know, spoken anecdote or comic dirty story or whatever, like oral forms find their way into written forms, which find their way back into oral forms again. So story is this active kind of thing. And I also have the sense that Boccaccio didn't invent most of these stories, that they're very old stories from other sources as well. Yeah, some of them old stories and some of them also very current stories. Like there's one that talks about the painter Giotto and there's one that talks about Guido Cavalcanti, you know, who was Dante's good friend, right? And competitor, right? And rival. Who we met in the Inferno, correct? Who, whose father we met in the Inferno. That's Guido right, that's gets right. talked about, right? Um, yeah, but, uh, but still having that quality of story, of orality, of anecdote, of immediacy. So some from a much longer time away, some from a uh, very current time. So we selected a handful of stories to read, and we're going to start with a few that have a quality that the Decameron is perhaps best known for, which is to say that they are a bit dirty, a bit sexy. And some of them are hilarious. Some of them are dirty and hilarious. Yeah, some of them are very funny. Some of them might be a little bit upsetting for some people, mm. but we've tried to stick with the fun ones. The first one that we're going to look at is on the second day. It's the seventh story. It's a story of Alatiel. Alatiel is the daughter of the Sultan of Babylon. She is sent off to marry the king of the Algarve, which is the southern part of Portugal. And along the way to Portugal, her ship ends up being wrecked. She's taken prisoner, but she's also seduced by her captor. But then every man who sees her falls desperately in lust with her and tries to kill her previous, um, I don't want to say owner, really, and I don't want to say lover or husband. Oh, or yeah, yeah. The inclination is to say owner, right? Because she's described over and over again as a thing, a, a cosa, a plaything. She's almost like a treasure or, or some highly prized object that goes from person to person. Like, she has her own agency. We can come back to that. But but it really is almost like from one owner to another. Yeah, exactly. She's passed along That's it. from man to man. And she ends up being passed along to, I guess, nine different men over the course of four years before, through a stroke of luck, she gets to return to the Sultan of Babylon, her father, with instructions on what to say to him in order to make it sound like She's been very good and pure this whole time, because it sounds like she's really enjoyed a lot of the sex that she's been having. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, that's what I meant by her having her own agency. Like, on the one hand, she's treated as an object. Like, she's beautiful. People fall in love with her, and she's passed from one man to another. But she also has these moments of control. She she takes pleasure in being seduced, in, in at least some of these cases. And then also, the way she finally breaks that cycle of being passed from man to man is when she encounters someone who knows her language. All this time, she's gone along as if she'd been cut off by the border of language, like she hasn't been able to communicate with any of these people all this time. Um, but she encounters a person called Antioco, and he speaks her language. And then through him, she gets in touch with an old acquaintance, Antigono, who had known her at the court of her father. And it's he who comes up with a plan that she's able to use, a plausible story she can tell that will get her back home and let her be sent off once again to the Algarve for that arranged marriage, as if none of this had ever happened, as if she had never circulated throughout the Mediterranean before. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat story in a lot of different ways. One of the ways it's really neat is that it's such a circular kind of story, like literally circular, and that her voyages kind of take her. She heads from Babylon in the east, Cairo, right? Just medieval texts refer to what we would call Cairo as Babylon. I thought Babylon was Baghdad. Well, they have two Babylons, right? Oh. So, so they they call Cairo Babylon, and then they also call like regular Babylon Babylon, right? So. Anyway, and so she starts off in the east, and then she gets sent to the west. Algarve literally means Algarve, the west, right? Um, even this modern Portugal, southern Iberian peninsula. So she heads out that way, and then she gradually finds her way back to the eastern Mediterranean, and then she's sent out again to the west in that arranged marriage. So there's that neat kind of structure to it. But it's also, as with the Decameron's whole structure. It's kind of an orderly structure that in 
closes chaos within it. And that chaos is expressed in those repeated encounters with men, you know, that pass her from hand to hand violently, like often the person who has her will be killed by the next person who acquires her. And there's just one beautiful, it's like kind of awful, but a beautiful passage that gives you an example of how this works. This is when the prince who has Alatiel is about to lose her to a duke. Okay, so the body of the prince falls to the ground, he's killed, and the duke's companion quickly produced a noose that he had brought along for the purpose and threw it around the neck of the other person there and drew it tight so that he could not make any noise. He was then joined by the duke and they strangled the man before hurling him out to join his master. This done, they satisfied themselves that neither the lady nor anybody else had heard them. And then the duke picked up a lantern, carried it over to the bed, and silently uncovered the woman who was sleeping soundly. Having exposed her whole body, he gazed upon her in rapt fascination, and although he had admired her when she was clothed, now that she was naked his admiration was greater beyond all comparison. The flames of his desire burned correspondingly fiercer, and, unperturbed by the crime he had just committed, he lay down at her side, his hands still dripping with blood, and made love to the woman, who was half asleep and believed him to be the prince. Mm. Isn't that a creepy and fascinating little scene? It sure is. Right? I was going to say she's okay, right? Like, we don't see her damaged or harmed physically in any way. Yeah, she does get kidnapped after this yeah, by the dude. Yeah. But it's not presented as something that is physically harmful for her. I mean, to be honest, she doesn't really get a chance to respond to this happening. No. You don't have a scene of her saying, oh, no, I've been kidnapped, or what have you done, or anything like that. Like, what happened to that guy I was having lots of great sex with? Yeah, no, she kind of manages, it's like almost like, riding the waves, right? She's she's managing the environment she's in, right? We don't get the sense of her being helpless, though, because as soon as she's able to be in a situation where she can take some steps toward returning home, finding someone who speaks her language, um, finding someone who can help her figure out a way to get back home, she's able to, to take that on. The other thing that I think is really fascinating about this episode, and I don't know if it stands out because we're only talking about a few different stories, it's one of a few stories in the camera that engage really explicitly with I don't want to say like an exotic world, deal with Muslim cultures in the Eastern and Mediterranean. There's also a couple of different stories that refer to Saladin, the really important ruler in the 12th century. And in some ways, these are part of a kind of a romantic vision of the Orient. But they're stories that also are very preoccupied with what sometimes gets talked about as a kind of mercantile ethic, an interest in trade and exchange, and an openness to thinking seriously about what individual people and cultures have to offer one another. So so I find that sort of um, strand of the stories in the Decameron to be particularly interesting. And the story of Alatiel at 2-7, and also the story we'll look at a little later of Messer Torello and Saladin on day 10, story 9, uh, I think really stand out as interesting in that way. The other thing that I find interesting about this story is, as you were saying, she doesn't have a connection to her language as she's being passed around from man to man like an object or something like an object. In the text, and in this translation that we're using, she's never referred to by name during that period. Her name is given early on in the text when they're setting it up and talking about her father, and her name is used again when she finds Antigono. But in that middle stretch where she's being passed around, her name doesn't appear. It's true. Again, it really heightens that sense of her as an object that's traded from person to person. Exactly. She's just her. She's just she. She's just marked for her gender, which is a really subtle and striking way of emphasizing that she's lacking language, that she's unable to communicate with anyone. Yeah. That moment where she emerges from that um, period of anonymity, I think, is so striking. This is when she sees Antigono, and she recalls having seen him in Alexandria, where he used to be in her father's service. So she shyly asked, right, because she's in a place where she can speak the language, right? She shyly asked whether she was right in thinking him to be Antigono of Famagusta. Antigono said that he was, adding, I have an idea, ma'am, that I've seen you before, but I cannot for the life of me remember where. Pray be good enough, therefore, if you have no objection, to remind me who you are. On hearing that this was indeed the man she had assumed him to be, the lady burst into tears and threw her arms around his neck, and asked her visitor whether he had ever seen her in Alexandria. No sooner had she put the question that Antigono recognized her as the sultan's daughter, Alatiel. The recognition scene there is quite powerful, and I think you know her name emerging there punctuates it in a really powerful way. It also struck me when I was reading it that this story feels a lot like a story that would have come from the Arabian Nights traditions. I don't know whether it actually does or not, but it 
had that feel, the pacing of it, the way things kept changing, the way the scene kept moving on. It had that vibe to me. Yeah. You know, that specific story doesn't have an, an analog in The Thousand and One Nights or Kalila Wadimna or any of those. But you're right about the pacing. I'm really looking forward to when we do The Thousand and One Nights to talk about frame tale narratives because I find them incredibly interesting in this whole tension between oral story and written story. There's a lot to say about that. And I love The Thousand and One Nights anyways. So we should move on to the next story, which is day three, story number one. What was the theme for day three? And day three has a lot of like smutty stories, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, day three, the topic is people who by dint of their own efforts, have achieved an object they greatly desired or recovered a thing they previously lost. Which doesn't sound sexy, but turns out a lot of sexy stories here. Yeah, no, day three has a lot going on. (laughs) So the first story, we've got a laborer, and his name is Masetto, and he basically finds out about this abbey where nuns are living, and he meets the gardener who had been working for them and who quit recently because he found the job exhausting. And he's retired. He's gotten older. Yeah, and he's just not up for it anymore. Especially digging the garden. Digging the garden is just too much work. (laughs) Yeah, tending to the garden is very hard work. But Maceto is young. (laughs) Yes, and he thought, I know what I can do. And he goes and he pretends like he can't speak. Mm. So he knocks on the door and he makes gestures as people who can't speak did to indicate that he's hungry and they bring him in and somehow they all work it out that he's going to tend their gardens. And he starts doing this. He tends a lot of their gardens. (laughs) Yes, indeed. (laughs) And so there's about eight nuns and a mother superior here. And some of the nuns get this idea in their head. They've heard the rumor that it's quite fun to have sex with a man. And so they take him aside. They do this. The other nuns find out. They also take their turn. Eventually, the mother superior gets the same notion in her head. Mm. And so after a while, they've got him worn out. He's exhausted. He's just exhausted. Between the garden and the nuns, it's just, that's a lot. And so finally, he meets with the mother superior (laughs) and he says, I have always been given to understand, ma'am, that whereas a single cock is quite sufficient for ten hens, ten men are hard put to satisfy one woman, and yet here I am with nine of them on my plate. I can't endure it any longer, not at any price, and as a matter of fact, I've been on the go so much that I'm no longer capable of delivering the goods, so you'll have to either bid me farewell or come to some (laughs) sort of arrangement." And so having gotten over the shock that this guy can talk after all, the mother superior says, well, why would you want to give up a good thing? And also, if he goes out there, he'll just tell the story to everybody and our reputations will be ruined. Mm. So they come to an arrangement and they abuse the gardener a little less and everybody is very happy at the end and he lives a good long life. It works out beautifully. And ultimately, he too retires as the former steward had retired. And it's described in this very charming way at the end of the story. Um, although he fathered quite a number of nunlets and monklets, it was all arranged so discreetly that nothing leaked out until after the death of the abbess, by which time Maceto was getting on in years and simply wanted to retire to his village on a fat pension. Right? He ends up as an elderly and prosperous father who was spared the bother of feeding his children and the expense of their upbringing, right? having had the sense to employ his youth to good advantage. And in this translation, the very the very ending, of, you know, when he's thinking of his good fortune, he says, and this, he maintained, was the way that Christ treated anybody who placed a pair of horns upon his crown. So you've got the horns of, of cuckoldry, right? Because the uh-huh. nuns are wedded to Christ. The pair of horns are put up on the crown, but it's also a joke about thorns on the crown and so forth. I don't know what the Italian is, but it's a very, very clever translation. Well, it's neat in a couple different ways, right? Because it would be easy to see this story as kind of like anti-clerical or saying something negative about convents and things like that. But it is and it isn't, right? Because that closing line, this is the way that Christ treated anyone who tried to cuckold him, right? That forgivingness, that, that inclination to forgive and that, you know, rewarding even of those who have done wrong, right? That's a very Christian thing to do, you know? I guess if it's anti-clerical at all, it's it's anti-clerical in a very playful kind of way and in a very not dark kind of way. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because even though this story, which is the first story on the third day and the tenth story on the third day are both you know, lewd stories. This one's got a very, I don't know, 
I don't want to say innocent, but a playful quality to it that's a bit different from what we see elsewhere, I think. Did that strike you that way too? Yeah, I feel like this is maybe more a case of humanizing the nuns. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. it has them thinking, well, you know, this is a sin, but we sin all the time in other ways. So what's the problem with this kind of way? Is this really that different? And nothing bad seems to come out of it. Yeah, no one is hurt. I guess that's what I'm struck by. No one is hurt here. Yeah, and so clearly Christ is okay with it. So clearly this is fine. Yeah, yeah. And so it feels like Boccaccio is saying it would be a better world if this is how we thought of things. <laughs> He's offering an alternative thought process through this jokey body story for how things could be. And there's this whole other level that's going on in it, too, which I find always really interesting, the way that the metaphor of the garden functions, right? And it's really explicit. So when um, Maceto first comes to the, the convent and the steward has introduced him to the abbess, he, he says to himself, he says, oh, once you put me inside that garden of yours, I'll tend it better than it's ever been tended before. Right? Yep. So that double entendre there is we're getting us primed to think about the garden as both the actual space he's going to work in as the gardener, but also the metaphor of the garden of the woman's body. And that's a metaphor that's very closely associated with Christian metaphors about especially the body of the Virgin Mary understood as a sealed garden. So there's this like... I don't know, almost allegorical quality to it, even though it's primarily a dirty story and a, you know, a funny, dirty story. Um, it's also inhabiting this other kind of metaphorical level, which I find really interesting, especially because the regatta, the, the community of people who are telling these stories, they are themselves in a garden space when they're telling the story in day three. They started out in one household that we mentioned, you know, about two miles outside of Florence. And then on the third day, they've moved to another estate, another physical environment, a different garden. They're kind of on the move. They'll move again uh, later on to yet another space, the Valley of Ladies. So the garden environment is also one that the storytellers themselves are inhabiting. For another metaphor, we can turn to uh, the same day, day three, but the final story of the day. So dirty that the translators would not even translate it for a long time. Yeah, this is probably the most infamous story in the collection. Oh, my God. So it stars a young woman. Well, she's like 13 or so, the book tells us. But, oh, my God. Which is younger than we would have her be to indicate of sexual age. But that seems to be what the indication is supposed to be here. Uh, Alabek. She is from Gafsa, which is in Tunisia. She is not a Christian, but there are lots of Christians around her. And she gets the idea that devoting her life to God in some way would be a good thing to do. So she asks them how to do it. And they say, well, you know, leave the city, leave the worldly things behind. You'll find hermits who can help you out, perhaps. And she does. But all the hermits she meets are like, mm, she is too attractive. This is way too much temptation. You want to talk to the other hermit down the way. <laughs> and after a series of such encounters, she finally meets one who feels like he is so good and pure that he'll be able to resist the temptation. He does not. He no. gets an idea into his head that he's going to seduce her and that he's got a good way to do it. Oh, let me read some of it. It's just, it's okay, just, go for you know, it. okay. So he says, he gives her a speech uh, telling her about the ways of serving God. And he says, of all the ways that God appreciates this service, the one that he most appreciated consisted in putting the devil back in hell to which the Almighty had consigned him in the first place. The girl asked him how this is done, and Rustico replied, you'll soon find out, but just do whatever you see me doing for the present. So he takes off his clothes till he's naked. She does the same. He sinks down to his knees. She does the same. In this posture, the girl's beauty was displayed to Rustico in all of its glory, and his longings blazed more fiercely than ever bringing about the resurrection of the flesh. Alabek stared at this in amazement and said, Rustico, what is that thing I see sticking out in front of you which I do not possess? Oh, my daughter, said Rustico, this is the devil I was telling you about. Do you see what he's doing? He's hurting me so much that I can hardly endure it. Oh, praise be to God, said the girl. I can see that I am better off than you are, for I have no such devil to contend with. You're right there, said Rustico, but you have something else instead that I haven't. Oh, said Alabek, and what's that? You have hell, said Rustico. <laughs> oh, and, and so, so it goes. <laughs> and so what do you do in this terrible situation? You try to put the devil back in hell where he belongs. And sometimes you have to do it over and over. 
Yeah, they do it so many times that he just passes out the first day. <laughs> and it hurts her at first, but she quickly grows to enjoy it and is demanding that the devil be put back in hell as often as possible. <laughs> and she says, I don't honestly recall having ever done anything that gave me so much pleasure and satisfaction as I get from putting the devil back in hell. To my way of thinking, anyone who devotes his energies to anything but the service of God is a complete blockhead. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Followed up by Rustico, who was living on a diet of her roots and water, was quite incapable of supplying her requirements and told her that the taming of her hell would require an awful lot of devils, <laughs> but promised to do what he could. So, yes, yeah, so she's getting more and more frustrated that he is no longer able to satisfy her. And eventually, her father and their entire family burn to death in a house fire. Yeah. And she inherits all the money. And a guy named Narabal goes out to find her, having heard that she's somewhere in the desert, takes her away. She's not happy about this, marries her. And then right before the wedding night and, and the festivities thereupon, she talks with some women and they ask her, how did she serve God out in the desert? And she explains through mostly gestures because she doesn't have the words for it. And they figure out what's going on and they laughed. And they are laughing still. <laughs> and the laughter within the story kind of bleeds over into the outside of the story because uh, at the end of um, Dionneo's account, all the women in the brigada are also laughing, right? So aptly and cleverly worded did Dionneo's tale appear to the virtuous ladies that they shook with mirth a thousand times or more, right? So it's such an interesting moment because there's laughter inside the story and also laughter outside the story. It's like it's contagious almost. And when we think about the function of story, what story is for, right? Um, um, you know, if you're laughing and you're with others, it's hard for you to be downcast or worried or stressed or fearful, right? Because you're in this other space. All three of these stories that we've looked at involve men seducing women and then the women getting really into being seduced and having sex and wearing the men out and or the men paying dearly hmm. for what they've decided to do. And that strikes me as a really interesting position to be having on like what the general plot of a slightly porny story should be. Yeah, looking for um, you know the moral high ground here is not a straightforward process. No, but it's also not the way that we tend to think about how sexuality works in our imaginations of how hetero men and women react to each other. And I think in some ways that makes these stories even funnier for us mm -hmm. or funny for us in a different way. Perhaps there's yeah. a sense in which yeah. like we're not, we're not as amused by the puncturing of taboos or talking about things that you shouldn't talk about so much, but the way that this plays out and the, and the sort of surprise of the women, I think, and, and, and their embrace of the sensual lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, I think really appeals to us, some of us these days. Yeah. No, that's a really interesting observation. Especially when you think about the ways in which, you know, in the Decameron, the Brigata, you know, the community of storytellers, they're very concerned about propriety. That is not just how people behave, but how that behavior is seen. Remember when the women are deciding to leave the city, they want to take men with them, not just because, you know, they like them and because they might be useful to the community, but they're seen in a different way. And why it's so important that the men be related, blood relatives, to some of the women in the group. Like, it's a functional society that observes the norms and the requirements of such a society, right? And so the taboos can be broken, right? All these transgressive things can happen in the stories, and the laughter can migrate from inside the stories to the audience that's hearing the stories. But the transgressive behavior itself that that's very carefully controlled. I guess I'm not explaining it very well, but it's like, it's interesting to me how the stories serve as a safe space almost for all kinds of transgressive imaginings and laughter and so on. Things that you might not be able to act on, but you can imaginatively inhabit. So not all the stories are sexy stories and we might as well we might as well read some of the other stories that have other types of charms. They're good. They're so oh, good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're absolutely good. Uh, they're just different, and, and they're kind of weird, some of them. Mm. Which ones do you especially like? Well, you had suggested that we look at the last two stories of the final day of day 10. Yeah. Did you like either or both of those? I liked both of them, but they're both strange. Oh, yeah. The ninth story is a long story about a guy who goes on crusade, but first Saladin, the 
uh, how, how would you describe Saladin? Well, Saladin was historically a ruler in the Eastern Mediterranean who's very well known for his acts in the Third Crusade. So he's somebody who whose reputation in the 14th century when Boccaccio was writing was both someone who was an incredibly important military leader, you know, driving off the Christians, but also someone who became an emblem for chivalric behavior, for noble behavior, for generosity, for opulence, um, for all kinds of virtues. There's a lot to say about that tradition. But what's kind of neat is that Saladin appears in this story mainly so that he can be in a kind of a competition over a long period of time with this person, Messer Torello, as to who is the most generous, who is the most munificent, who can outdo the other in a show of generosity. So it's a competition, but it's a very positive one. Yeah, the whole competition involves sort of tricking the others into accepting their hospitality, which is really curious. Yeah. So it starts out when Saladin and his companions, they're disguised as merchants, sort of doing reconnaissance before the Third Crusade, right? They're checking out what's going on in Europe, and they want to gather information, right? And they're in Italy, and Messer Torello encounters them on the road, and he tricks them into coming to his country place for a night of hospitality. They're said to be cleverly beguiled. And then he tricks them after that into coming to his house and Pavia. So uh, it's trickery, but it's a very benevolent kind of trickery. He gives them food and drink. He has them greeted in this really sumptuous way by the nobles in the city. He introduces his wife and kids to them. Uh, He leaves his wife alone with them, which I always think is such a neat telling detail. It shows not just generosity, but a very high level of trust, not easy to repay. Um, And before Saladin and his companions leave, the wife of Messer Torello makes them beautiful robes uh, that she's made herself to, to take with them. And then Saladin goes back. He has the information he needs, and the crusade gets underway. And meantime, Torello has come along on crusade, and he gets captured. And his family thinks he's dead, because another person, also named Torello, did die on the crusade. So it's mistaken identity. Um, In the meantime, Torello is off there. He's captured, but he's really good at falconry. And those skills get him noticed by Saladin's household, uh, by the court. And he's sort of in the household. Saladin refers to him as the Christian, right? But then there's a moment when Saladin suddenly recognizes who it is he has. And, you know, we were talking before about the story of Alatiel in 2-7 and how the recognition scene is such a powerful moment. In the story of Torello and Saladin at 10-9, recognition is a really, really powerful thing, both in the encounter with Saladin and Torello, where Torello is recognized, but also a little later on when Torello and his wife are going to have this very powerful recognition scene. So when Torello is in Saladin's service, Saladin recognizes him and he puts out on his bed robes that um, he wears. And he says to Torello, take a look at these clothes, Christian, and tell me whether you ever saw any of them before. And Torello sees the robes and he recognizes the ones that his wife had given Saladin. And then they have this sort of joyous reunion. Saladin throws his arms around Torello and says, you are Messer Torello. I am one of the three merchants. And the time has now come to persuade you of the quality of my merchandise, as I promised you I would, God will on the day I departed. So they're happy to be together. But then Torello discovers that his family thinks he's dead. And he's like, I have to get back as quickly as possible. And Saladin really hopes he won't go. But if he must go, he's going to send it back with jewels and gold and everything. And he's not going to send him back by ship. He's going to send him back by way of a magical bed. So he puts them on the <laughs> puts him on this bed heaped with gold and jewels and a beautiful golden crown for Mrs. Torello back home and has his magician come in and send Torello back to where he came from. And so Torello turns up in the church back at his hometown. The priest is completely freaked out, but everything turns out okay. Uh, Torello gives him some money for the church, and then he arranges to meet with his wife. But in the meantime, his wife, thinking he's dead, has finally agreed to remarry. And that very night, the wedding feast is taking place. So at the feast, Torello is there as a guest wearing exotic clothing. Nobody really knows who he is. And, but when the ceremonial cup of wine is passed around at the wedding feast, he takes the opportunity to drop into the cup when it passes before him um, the ring that his wife had given him. So the cup finds its way back to Mrs. Torello, Mrs. Torello's wife, and she lifts it to her lips. She sees the ring and she stands up and says, that truly is my husband. That is Mrs. Torello. And she turns the table over. And there's utter chaos in this joyous <laughs> recognition scene. It's such a great story. There's so much hubbub. But the recognition scenes are like these powerful, powerful moments um, and joyous moments, right? And moments that show the fecundity of all the generosity that's been sown throughout this whole story. 
that final scene at Mrs. Trello's wedding that doesn't quite happen at the last minute it seems like a weird kind of one-upping of the end of the Odyssey, right? Mm. Like he, he arrives disguised just in time. There's a really dramatic recognition scene, but instead of killing everybody, he's just going to, you know, end the marriage and, and then make everything a little bit better. But it's generosity. You know, this story is about the, the theme of the day is munificence, right? Very generous giving. And we're meant to mostly see this in the exchange of Saladin and Torello. But it's also in this moment, because what he's done when he sends the ring in the cup is he's giving it to her, right? He's like, it's up to you. Yeah. Right. He's not going to like say, oh, I'm back. I'm here to claim my wife, my property. He sends the ring back to her so that she, right, she could either let the wedding go on or not. No, that's very true. Right. I mean, that doesn't get talked about explicitly, you know, by by the community of storytellers or anything like that. But it, But it's part of that generous free giving that goes on and almost kind of one act of generosity engenders another and another and another. I don't really understand the munificence in the final story. Yeah. Which is kind of a terrible story. Well, remember, it's Dioneo, right? It's the 10th story, right? So it's the transgressive story. So what does a transgressive story look like, you know, in the context of stories of munificence? It's the story of what Dioneo calls at one point, full bestialità, crazy bestiality, right? Um, on the act of Gualtieri against his wife, Griselda. Yeah, to make it very short, a Marquis of Saluzzo marries a peasant woman and basically gaslights her for a oh, long time. Oh, it's awful. It's just awful. It's a famous story, but it's like awful. Yeah, and, and I believe Chaucer used it, although I haven't read his version. Yeah, it's, it's in his clerk's tale. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they have some kids. He pretends he had to kill the kids Oops. and sends them away. Uh -huh. mm. <laughs> uh, eventually, after after... 13 years, he says, you know, actually, I need to marry somebody who is a noble person, not a little peasant, so you can go back home and... <laughs> but first, fix up the house for the wedding. <laughs> yeah, come back, actually. Clean up the house, because you're the only one who knows how to do it, and I need to get married. And she is long-suffering. She accepts all of this. She is very graceful the whole time. The children are going to be killed? Well, my husband knows best. We're divorced? Well, you know, I, I started out poor. I never expected this to last, so, you know, I'm, I enjoyed it while it happened, but you know best. Mm. And finally... At the end of it, when she's at the wedding, it's revealed that the the bride is actually her daughter who is alive. And, you know, her son's alive. And the other daughter, everybody's alive and we're going to be married forever and it's all happy. Happy ending. <laughs> and, like, she's been very, very good. And <laughs> Oh, man. This is just brutal. Oh, my God. It's just awful. I mean, it's a good story, but it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> But this is one of the most fascinating things, because usually at the end of the night of storytelling, everybody's laughing at Dionea's final story. Mm. This time, it ends with them disagreeing and debating about it. Yeah. This is a story that has split the room. The ladies, some taking one side and some another, some finding fault and some commending other details. And the idea that at the very end of the very last story, it presents people talking about the story, dissecting it, arguing about it, living with it and carrying it with them and, and continuing to, to mull over it after the stories are done seems like a really interesting note to end on, right? It's a really appropriate way of concluding a massive section of stories. These aren't just like light tales. They're things that you're going to carry with you. And that response to the story kind of bleeds over into what happens immediately afterward in the frame, because they have these different views of the story they've just heard. And then the person who's the king for that day, Pamphilo, says, you know, we've had this day. It's been wonderful and positive in all these ways. But he says, I now think it proper that with your consent, we should return whence we came. And so he suggests that he'll keep the crown to keep the rule until the next morning to arrange all the logistics. And then they'll go back to Florence. But he says, if you decide otherwise, I already have someone in mind upon whom to bestow the crown for the next day to follow. And then, this is the interesting part, the ladies and the young men, having debated the matter at considerable length, considered the king's advice in the end to be sensible and just and decided to do as he had said. Right? So it's not like he orders them to do something or it's not like they make this kind of snap decision. They debate and discuss it at length. So what they've been able to do with story is something that they're then able to do in the real world, and they're ready to go back to the real world and deal with all that crap back in Florence that they've left behind, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're in a different place mentally now. 
That's true. They're also very anxious that other people might find out what they've been doing and crash the party. Yeah. Which I think is a really <laughs> interesting. We better wrap this up. Other people are going to come and it's it, just the mood's going to change. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, so they go back. I mean, it's only been two weeks. I'm not sure how quickly the plague has gone away or, or anything like that. But this is the thing. It's not about that the city will be different. They'll be different. I mean, that's, I think that's the whole point, right? It's not that they're, I think this is a really important point. It would be easy to see this as like, oh, there's plague in Florence, they're fleeing Florence, and like, that's what it's about. It's not primarily that. They they do flee, but they can come back because they've changed. Exactly. They're, they're leaving, they're basically taking a mental health break. Yeah, yeah. And they're regathering their sense of the world in isolation from the world. Yeah. And look what they need to do. Like, it's not just that they need these stories, though they do need them. They look at the, I mean, in the frame, look at the life they lead. Like, they they do things at particular times. I mean, it's a life of leisure, right? Yeah, no, this is the 1%. Yeah, no. Like, but they do things at particular times. They eat at particular times. They play music at particular times. They tell stories at particular times. They can take their nap at a particular time. You know, it's like, <laughs> but, but it, they're trying to shape their time, right? Like, if you imagine the the chaos and the horror that they've left behind, right? This is how they give form to life again. I think that's so powerful and so moving, right? Like that their individual health, they they can't be healthy individually. Their health is absolutely contingent on their communal health. So that's about all the time we have today for the Decameron. Of course, there are 95 other stories we could have talked about, and you're encouraged to go check them out and enjoy them. We decided to do this episode as a kind of special episode in response to the pandemic that's happening right now. But we're hoping, even if the world doesn't get back into mm-hmm. normality anytime soon, that we would do a normal cluster next. We'll see what happens with that. We decided we wanted to do a cluster on the 19th century English novel, which is to say we decided we wanted to do a cluster on class. And so we're going to be starting with Jane Austen's novel, Emma. Yeah, which is really good. I mean, it has wonderful sections. Like, I always get a little bit bored when I reread it in certain places, but I absolutely love other parts of it. So we'll pick out all the plums. I haven't read it in a long time. It was one of my favorites of hers when I first read it. Yeah, me too. And, you know, she's great. I don't think anybody needs to be told that these days, (laughs) but um, I'm super looking forward to returning to it. I haven't read it in decades. But in the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you're reading these days. Show notes for things that we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 27. And The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time, stay well. We'll see you again at the Spouter Inn.